Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of the D2 Talks. On this channel, every week we bring you the best talks from the archivist industry. So if you're new here, please do consider subscribing. This week I'm very pleased to have Mike Golden of Three Marks. Mike and I talked briefly in Vienna a couple of years ago and since then we stayed in touch. We tried to do something on my own channel where we talked about the business side of things, but I was also very interested to know a little bit more about this journey, also from an artistic and personal perspective. Anyway, I consider Mike a little bit of an artisan from this industry. This talk was very inspiring and very eyes-opening if that's a phrase and we are very happy to say that Mike will be speaking at the conference this year in Vienna so we look forward to welcome you to the D2 conference 2018 but for now enjoy this talk Two, one and we are live <laughs> I always awesome. say we are live but we're not live we're just well, recording well you get to one you're not supposed to say you're supposed to give it the uh, little <laughs> <laughs> three two <laughs> and <Mike. we're> in. <laughs> how are you man i'm great man how are you doing fabio yeah not too bad not too bad it's been kind of a um a fire week uh when <laughs> this this interview will be online the the things that i'm working on will already be published so i can already tell you we're working on a on a on an event here in tel aviv I'm trying to help out uh, my one of my friends, which is a chaos reseller. And, you know, we're working really hard. We're trying to make things move also here a little bit because, you know, it's, awesome. a, it's an interesting uh, uh, place where people can work. And I think that if we share the knowledge, uh, we can empower people to work better and to have a decent life because ultimately this seems to be always the problem, you know? <laughs> always, always, always. Never dude, enough time in the day. Dude, first of all, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. Um, oh, thank you for having me, man. I, I'm honored. Probably, you know, it's a, one thing that I really like about you and about your work is that you're very, you're a very outgoing person if you get to, if people get to meet you in person. <laughs> but like on social media, you're a very quiet guy, <laughs> work really hard. Your work is stunning. I'm going to show thank some you. of your work. Uh, on on the screen right now. This is your Instagram. Oh, thank you very much. And basically, you know, let's give a little bit of a uh, of a background about who you are and where you have worked, because you know, it's it's actually kind of a big <laughs> deal, right? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Um, so yeah, so I started in like three D. I have an undergraduate degree in philosophy. Okay. Uh, which, you know, I used about as well as anybody uses a philosophy degree. Uh, <laughs> I went to Alaska and, and worked on charter fishing boats. <laughs> and uh, and then, I guess, what, nine years ago, I started architecture school um, in Philly. And that was the first time I ever opened a 3D software or Photoshop or anything like that in 2009. And really quickly in school, I realized that Making the images for my projects was way, way, way more fun than actually designing the projects. Um, I so think I, that happened to a lot of people. <laughs> in this industry, I feel like a lot of people are like, eh, designing, eh, that's yeah. a lot of work and kind of frustrating. Making the images, that's like condensed and the fun part. Yeah. So so I, I focused on that pretty much the whole time I was there. And um, then after school, I went and worked for D-Box. Um, I was at D-Box for a little over two years as an art director of CGI. And then, uh, and that's, you know, first time I opened 3DS Max was in, uh, at D-Box. Um, learned a, a shit ton uh, of... <laughs> it's okay, don't worry. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Christian learned, channel. <laughs> learned, learned a ton. Um, learned a ton. And then uh, I, I left there and I worked for an architect named Thomas Johansson. Who does? Okay. Is um, it, uh, based in New York. Based here in New York, and he is, uh, I think, an, he's a socialist from from um, from I think uh, Denmark. Okay. But he's been tit he's been titled the architect for the one percent. He does like <laughs> a, he does like these very beautiful um, but very luxurious apartments for the most part, and he's just starting to do a few buildings. Um, 
but I worked for him for in-house to Tell help me the him. name again so I can Google it and I can put some pictures. Thomas? Oh, Thomas Yule Hansen. Um, J-U-U-L-H-A-N-S-E-N. Thomas Johansson, architect. Hold on. Because I thought you say Thomas Johansson. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he would probably like it if I had said that. Um, he, uh, but yeah, so he does really beautiful work. And I worked there kind of has his more or less like sole image maker to help him sell his uh, vision to his client so that he would kind of cut down on... Um, the amount of back and forth with his clients. Okay. Uh, so I did that for a year and a half, and I kind of had sole reign of how I did things. So I worked out a lot of my process and kind of my own way of getting things done there. And then after that, I went out on my own and started three marks, and that was. Oh, so basically, this two or three years. This architect uh, job came after D Box. Yes. Ah, so okay. I left. I left D Box uh, with the intention of starting on my own. And then that job came along, and I wasn't really ready to start on my own either. And so it kind of seemed like an opportunity that I could work out a lot of the kinks in my own process mm -hmm. um, whilst having a steady job still. Okay, uh, that's, that's a very good um, strategy. I mean, this is what we, what we teach our clients. This is something else, uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it's very clever that you say this because a lot of people ask all the time, how do you start, you know, being on your own? Yeah, and one of and, that, biggest, and it's a hard question. Yeah. One of the biggest mistakes is to just jump into it. I mean, you know, it's a, a lot of Facebook memes kind of suggest that you should <laughs> jump into it and live your dream. But, you know, the reality of things is that that just confuses you. You know, you should do it in a structured way. Yeah, because at the end of the day, I feel like it, it's if you want to go out on your own, no matter how much you prepare for it and put in the bank or kind of set yourself up for success, taking that step into working for yourself is always going to feel like jumping off a cliff. Mm. It's always going to feel that way. Um, and so a lot of those me memes are right. You do eventually just have to do it, but you can set yourself up for success in a, in, in a kind of a structured way before you actually do it. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, no, I mean... It's, it's very good that you're saying this because, you know, a lot of people... Uh, find themselves in this position. I think it's mainly because of the fact that, you know, when you become a creative uh, or when you want to work in the creative field, because it's not like you become a creative, but <laughs> when you want to work in a creative field, uh, part of the creativity uh, job description, so to say, is for you to be in charge of the creative process. Otherwise, you know, you're just yeah. an execution guy. Yeah. And I feel like, uh, I think it's very easy to fall into a, I don't want to call it a rut, but to, just to stay where you're entirely comfortable. I think that's kind of the natural inclination is like, I can do this one thing. I can do it well. I'm going to keep doing it because I can't afford for a project to go poorly or to not get this client or whatever it might be. Um, and so if you, if you jump out a little too early you, you risk not getting a chance to really develop your own style. Yeah. Uh, like, you do that while you're working, but you want, I think you want to have a little bit of time beforehand where you have a decent amount of work that's like, this is what I like doing, and this is how I like doing it. And then you can learn and grow and develop that more on your own when you're fully on your own. But I think you want to have an idea of, like, what type of clients do I want? What, what type of work do I want to produce? How quickly can I produce an image? Like, you know, gun to my head, I need to produce an image that I'm not embarrassed by. How much time do I need for that? Yeah. Um, and those are all things that I think you really only get to figure out um, while you're making stuff for yourself. So if you, you know, do that at a job, it's awesome. Let me, let me just say something. I'm going to throw it out there. But <laughs> don't you think that now, basically, you know, that kind of introspection comes from the fact that you probably studied you know, uh, that kind of stuff. Because, I mean, you know, very often the, the uh, very basic questions I see that people simply cannot answer, you know. And you have just addressed uh, a huge chunk of the way our brain works, you know, in the process of finding your own style. And I think this is incredibly important. And you have done it whilst I was showing some of your pictures from the uh, Drokies account. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you and, very much. Uh, you know, these are like old small sketches, we can call them. Uh, yep. Small sketches, you know, <laughs> what the hell? Some of them are really like complex. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, and, you know, whilst we were discussing uh, before starting the interview, one quality that I really like about your work is that there is this uh, artisanal feeling to it, you know, like oh, thank you. Uh, care for details and sort of like, uh, yeah, really introspective speculation, uh, you know, research. I don't know. I think that uh, a lot of people don't do this kind of stuff. And, you know, now you put it online, but I'm not sure if other people are doing it at least for themselves, you know, if they have a sketchbook or something. Can you tell me a little bit more about these sketches? Yeah, they, um, I mean, to some, some degree that started out of what I was just saying, which is if you look at my, like, I'm very comfortable making sets of images for high-end luxury apartments. Um, like most of my paid work, is in that niche and it's very comfortable and I like doing it for the most part, but it's also, you know, I've gotten to a point where I'll spend a, you know, a couple of days working solely on bathrooms and I'll be a little bit tired of working on bathrooms. Um, I obviously understand why clients need them and, and I'm not arguing for or against them, but you kind of get this, uh, I at least get this kind of pent up feeling of like, it could be cooler, it could be more interesting or anything like that. And I think that Droki sprang out of this feeling of I need to continue making things that get me excited all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so whether that's just practice or just for the satisfaction of making it or um, another kind of like the types of things that I'm thinking about is let's make the things that are just fun. No client. I get to make all the rules. I, I can do a great job or a bad job or whatever I want on it. Um, but what can can I get out of that and what can I see? Here are things that I like. How can I then take that into my paid work? Right? But if you don't spend the time finding what those things are for yourself, you're never going to find them just when you're working on client work. Yeah. All right? Because there's so many other stresses and pressures and, and obligations that you say, oh, I want to make this beautiful, um, you know, like moody image that looks like X or whatever it might be. If you don't have something that you can say to a client and be like, something like this, I think we should do something like this, they're never going to let you do it. Uh, but if you can point to something you've done and say, like, this was a different project, but what do you think of this? Then you have the opportunity, or at least giving your client an opportunity to say, that's awesome, let's do it. Um, but you need to find that for yourself. You can't wait for your client to ask you to find it. Um, and you can't expect them to pay you to find it. Yeah, no, of course, of course. Now what I'm doing, I'm, I'm playing the video of your making of of this project <laughs> with, uh, with uh, you know, with the two, what do you want to call them? They're, you know, people, but they're not really from this world. They're my um, little, they're my little rock guys that I sculpt all the time in ZBrush. No, it's um, actually really, really cool. I mean, it's, uh, it's in a way also a little bit mesmerizing to look at, uh, <laughs> at, the, at the whole process, how, the, how these things come out. Um, I want to ask you, you know, you worked at D-Box. Mm -hmm. Now, D-Box is one of those super high-end companies that produce basically Hollywood movies for apartments. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, I mean, how much were you able to to get and to implement from that kind of a, a workflow um, in your own client work? Because obviously, I don't know if you kind of own a production studio like the the D box one, but you know what D box managed to build was you know huge. It was. It's huge. It's massive. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think you you can. Um, I don't think you at the moment are doing the same kind of stuff as D Box, right? No, I mean I'm kind of, I'm in a similar sphere in the sense that we're both dealing mostly with residential majority residential architecture, um, but like I'm a, I'm a primarily one man shop. Um, okay. So I have uh, a few friends that I use to help me out when I need. Um, more work done, excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a guy named Tom Schillinger out in Colorado 
that helps me a lot with like furniture stuff. So like I have other people helping me to get things done on time and efficiently. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, I'm, you know, this desk, you know, right here is where everything comes through and gets out of. That's where the magic happens. <laughs> <laughs> right here, right here. Uh, this is where I don't sleep ever. Sometimes <laughs> The chair is for napping. I mean, uh, at the moment, what's the time over there? Uh, it is almost 2 a.m. Yeah, I, this is crazy, guys. Uh, you know, I complained that I had to get up at 7 to do this, this interview. <laughs> but, you know, it's 2 a.m. over there. Well, last night I had to stay online with a client until 3 o'clock in the morning. So, you know, it's... Uh, uh, no sleep for Fabio last yeah, night. Thank you for getting up for me. <laughs> it, it, it's not the first time, but I, it, it's okay. You look well-rested and beautiful as ever, Fabio. <laughs> it's a, I keep young. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> and the beard covers most of it. That's that's the whole trick to it. Now, dude, I'm I'm playing this video, the the one that you have done whilst you talk, and it's uh, it's hard to you know to focus on one thing or the other. <laughs> no, but seriously, uh, this is impressive work. You know, it's uh, uh, and to think that it's coming out of a one man show. This is really like, what what's your secret? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's two a.m. and I'm sitting here working on uh, on a hotel that's my uh, secret. <laughs> um i mean i i'm not good at managing people and i don't particularly enjoy managing people and i'm a bit of a uh, of a of a control freak when it comes to the work um but i also love making it so i don't want to i don't want to find myself in a position where i'm just overseeing work getting done because i enjoy doing it um and When I my time at Dbox, you know, Dbox has it's probably seventy some odd employees, probably more now. Um, Seven, Jesus, that's that's huge. Because because they have all their project managers, they have all their account managers, they have all of their graphic design and web team. And then when I was there, I think there was twelve people on the three D team, and I think London had about that same number on the three D side. Okay. Um, and now they have the Miami office also, which. Uh, last time I was down there, I think they had maybe six 3D artists. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of lot of things in the air. You know, um, Keith and Matthew. Matthew founded it. Keith is creative officer, COO, I think is his title. They have to spend a lot of time overseeing projects and making sure that they're going in the right direction, that stepping away and doing it for another project. And I, and I very much still like having my hands on it. I don't want to give that away. Um, so I've been hesitant to grow. I also like not having a lot of overhead. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that there's a lot of risk, particularly D-Box has done a phenomenal job of keeping their work consistent with a lot of artists working on it. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of other firms you see starting to get into the like 10 to 12 people. And then you look at all their work and you say, oh, that image is great. And that image is, that must have been the B team. Mm -hmm. and, you, and it's just very hard to kind of keep that whole um, consistency and quality um, as you grow, I think. Uh, these are very cool insights because sometimes I guess people simply don't realize it, you know. They just assume, oh, it's all easy when you have a company, you know, the company works by itself. But actually, I think that strategically and logistically, there are so many issues with... Uh, with having a, uh, a company the size of D-Box that I yeah. totally get your point, you know, and I, I very much share it with you as well. I mean, um, I'm involved in a lot of other projects where I kind of work in a way where I rather consult my clients instead of uh, owning my own huge firm with other people. Also because I think that at the moment, uh, one of the... The biggest issues is that uh, people, th there is an expectation about the way work should be. And in today's society, I think that you have to take the situation in your hand and actually make the best out of it all the time. And a lot mm -hmm. of artists, a lot of young people, they fail to understand this. And it will take time to kind of uh, influence the community and let them understand that if they don't do the work, nobody will bring it to them. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, this is something that I personally am very interested in because I've been a teacher at university. I have, you know, um, 
helped creating a lot of other initiatives where the biggest problem is that if you did not push people, uh, things would not move, you know? Yeah. So, it, in a way, kudos to you for fucking <laughs> doing all this stuff. <laughs> I, I, oh, I, I think... Swear. <laughs> uh, see, it's not I just me. <laughs> not just me. Uh, it, it's, it's such a hard thing, and I think that... I think that the one thing that I totally agree with what you said is that if you want certain type of work or if you want to be working on certain types of projects and a certain type of style, that is entirely up to you. Um, when I was at D-Box, uh, all the portfolios that got sent to them, which, as you can imagine, is a very large number of portfolios, you know, I every other Friday sat down and went through all of them um, and kind of sorted them into other people should look at these, other people should not look at these piles and one of the things that you see so much is you see you'd see somebody applying from like OMA let's say and all of the work in their portfolio would be in the OMA style which is fine because if they were working there that's how the majority of the portfolio is going to be the professional work but when you don't see anything else I always got started to get red flags you know are they not making other work for themselves are they what what would they look like if what would their work look like if nobody told them how to make it and i think that's a really important thing whether you want to work for someone else or yourself one of the important things is you can't wait for the opportunity um to be presented to you to do the work you want to do if you want to work for a firm like mir who does very beautiful very atmospheric work you should be teaching yourself how to make them make that style or, or work in that genre on your own Right. And then you'll learn some things and you'll have a portfolio that says, like, look, the things that I like to make are in line with the things that your studio is already making. If you can get that job, then you can continue growing even more, obviously, with like minded artists um, and very talented bunch of artists around you. But like, you can't wait for permission to do what it is you want to do. Um, you're you're 100 percent right. You know, um, this morning I got an email um of a guy that you know saw my videos on YouTube and said, I want to apply for jobs in this region and I'm, do you have a template for an email that I can use? And I was like, this is the worst strategy that you can actually <laughs> use, you know? Yeah, absolutely it is. It, you pursue the thing that you want, but that thing could be three jobs. Yeah. Because, you know, it, it, I think that people very often what they fail to understand is that, you know, we, the, 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 the best way that we can interact with others is when we find um, a relatable aspect. I mean, the reason why I wanted to interview you is because, you know, uh, there is this very big contrast about you, you know, coming from D-Box and now doing the work that I showed on your video and uh, beautifully crafted images. Thank you. Being on your own, uh, which I think is what defines you. Thank you. With a lot of other people, that defining is not there. And it, it feels like, you know, they're, people are just hunting for understanding who they are. And until they don't get that out of the way, they are not valuable work material, you understand? Mm -hmm. Because they, they, they basically put themselves out as a commodity. Yeah, And, you know, very often it's also a, a question of like, you know, you cannot help these people because they're trying so hard that they are not looking outside of their uh, uh, walls, you know. Yeah. I mean, in a way, I think that we need more talks like this where you tell people, you know, that's how you do it. That's, that's how you should look into, uh, into a, creating your own career. Because it's not about, uh, you know, putting... People say all the time, put yourself out there. Yes, but with methodology, with planning. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just, like, just do. Whatever it is you want to... Like, if you want to make photorealistic images, start making photorealistic images. If you want to make, you know, moody painterly images, start making them. And the first ones you try to do will probably suck. You know, like, at least as far as my experience has been, the first time you try to do anything, it is no good. It is not what you thought it was going to be. It does not live up to the dreams. Um, 
and you just and you don't need to necessarily put that out there if you don't want to if you don't want feedback on it but you need to keep doing it because it's only by like hitting that first rail that first obstacle and pushing through it that then you start to see either a how you can get to your original goal or very very possibly actually i think i want to pivot a little bit yeah. by like by by putting your kind of um presumptions about what you want to do under that strain they'll start to crack and break and shape into something that's like okay here's how i like to work um i think continue, continue talking about this pivot thing because you know very often uh when you tell somebody maybe you should change or look into something else they look at it as an insult you know they go like what are you talking about i'm good yeah. at this you know i'm not uh, <laughs> But please continue talking about this because, you know, if it doesn't come from me and it comes from somebody else, probably the argument is a little bit more credible. <laughs> I don't know. But the more people that say it, right? Um, I mean, it's for, my, for my own experience, you know, one of the things that I really, that motivated me to, to go out on my own initially was I wanted to make more. D-Box dealing with very large companies and dealing with the fact that they're doing the, the web development, the branding of the site, and all these other things meant that projects tended to take a very long time. And one of the things that I've, I, I, I don't have ADD, but I do get very bored very quickly. And so there's nothing worse for me personally when you make that, the first time the image starts to come to life is when I'm most excited. When you're setting up lighting and cameras for the first time, for any given image, that's my favorite part of the process. And um, and then you can very quickly go from that to like a pretty polished image. And you're like, this is awesome. This is amazing. If that image then goes through three or four more rounds of review and takes another month, <laughs> like by the time you're done with that image, you're just like, thank God it's over. <laughs> Which is just a terrible way to finish a, a, an image or a project. Like I want to finish a project and be like, hot damn, that is awesome. <laughs> Next thing, you know what I mean? That's how I'd like to end every one of my projects. I, I uh, wanna, I wanna give you a hug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and so that was that was a large motivation. Was I want to do things quicker? Um, I want to have less rounds of review. I want to produce more images overall. Um, how can I control the process so that happens? And I'd say like the first. The, the year and a half that I was at Thomas Johansson's, because I wasn't making marketing images, I was making images that were only really being used by Thomas to present to his clients um, to, you know, here's what the, the apartment's going to look like. I had to make a lot of them. I think my first year there, I, I was keeping track. I made like 220 images um, that year. Um, Whoa. A lot of images. That's like an image a day. More or less. Um, more, and, but there, there's a lot of work from that. I can't really show any of it, unfortunately, but on my website, there's a, at least one or two projects still from that time. Um, do you still do work for him? Uh, each now and again, I've helped him out. Um, but by and large, by and large, most of my clients are developers at this point. Um, not architects directly, which I'm kind of thinking about trying to change a little bit. We're see, I have a lot of thoughts that are in the jokey direction of, of other venues. But, um, but going through that process, now that was more images than I wanted to make because there would be things that I wasn't quite happy with and, and everything else. But I learned how to work very quickly. And I also realized uh, the thing that you don't want to do and that I think is, is, is um, so common in our industry is the first time you show an image to a client, it's a white box with like a generic lighting or no lighting, ambient inclusion render of like, here's your three cameras, take a pic. And inevitably, none of those look good. And the client will look at them and say like, the widest camera tucked way back in the room, let's do that. But then let's make it wider. And also let's, uh, you know, maybe we cut through the wall. And so now you are only at like the modeling phase of this project and you basically have no chance of making a good image anymore, right? Like the composition's bad, it's a bad camera, it's gonna be uphill until the finish. Um, 
So I don't show any white boxes. I don't show any wireframes. And I don't show any cameras that I don't think are going to be a good image. If they ask for that camera in the back that shows the whole entire room, it's, you know, a 14 millimeter camera. I don't show it to them and I don't give them as an option. And if they ask for it, I say no. Um, but to deal with that, the first time they see the image, it already looks pretty finished. Um, because my work's very 3D heavy and not very post heavy anymore, that's an option. And if it's a living room, let's say, if there's one good image looking this way and there's another good image looking this way, and then there's one crap one in the middle that shows the whole room, without charging an additional fee, I'll just make both these images. And I'll deliver both images and they get more content for their Instagram when the project launches and for their website and everything else. Those two images together will show the entire room and those two images will take less work than one bad image because I'm not working uphill. The composition is fundamentally sound and it's you good see, to go. This is working cleverly. Thank and you. you know, very often people get hooked on numbers. No, I made two images. Yeah. Yes, but in theory, you're still delivering only one project if that works better. Then of course, you know, you can argue with the client and say, listen, we're gonna do it. What you have in mind, will not work if you let me do it and you give me a little bit more money i give you the guarantee that this is going to work and if you really show the client that you're doing this because of its interest and not because of your own you say listen we can do it your way uh full control i'll give it to you but i'll also show you what it will be like if i give you the my option when the client sees it it is a little bit more work for you but you know what happened? The next time, the client won't even argue. It will mm -hmm. say, do your thing. You know what I mean? That's a hundred. the first time with any of my clients always takes more work because I need to explain my process. They all get scared when they first see my contract and it says rounds of review one. Like they're like, that's not going to fly. I, I don't think I've had a client yet that's not pushed back on that. And I've said, let's just... Set up a time, we'll sit down, I'll show you an example of my process. If you still don't like it, you know, that's fair, and we'll go our separate ways. But I trust you, that one round of review is not what you're used to um, at all. And it's very important that you're saying this, it's, and refreshing, to be honest, you know. And, and I really hope, I really hope, I mean, these videos usually serve the purpose only for 5% of our audience. 5% will sit in front of these videos, will watch the whole thing, and will get something out of it. It's inevitable, you know? Uh, even my clients, I have a, a success rate, which is, you know, probably 20%. 80%, mm -hmm. they, uh, you know, I'm talking about the consultation. Uh, yeah. They come to me just because they want to be petted in a way, you know? And, and I try to deliver the same kind of consultation that I can do uh, with a client that I know is going to be successful. It is just, you know, the way it is. But what you just say, this is gold. You know? <laughs> and, I, and I just wish that people will come back and say, Mike, listen, can I chat with you for five minutes because I have a couple of questions to ask you. And, you know, getting that conversation going will make the life better for everybody because I'm not talking about standardizing the, the kind of, like, production, but having sort of like you know if you look at the car industry mm -hmm. bmw and mercedes yes they are different cars but they all serve the same purpose they all have certain safety standards mm -hmm. you know it's not like you get a car and in one you get a rocket that it's going to explode and <laughs> you, have, you understand what i'm trying to say so yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of like uh, making sure that people know what it's like even as an artist, if you then offer a rendering for like $500 and you're like, I'm getting wildly underpaid, as an artist, you will feel bad that you're not getting paid the money that a oh, good absolutely. artist gets paid. You know what I Absol mean? Absolutely, you will. And also, I find that, you know, the more that I, the more a client tries to negotiate price with me, the less inclined I am to work with them. 
Um, because at least in my experience, like at the beginning where I would occasionally be like, yeah, we'll give you 10% off or something like that. You've set up from the beginning, this situation that, you know, you'll kind of bend to their whims. And at the end of the day, you know, and if you're just starting out, that might not be a bad thing. You need to build clients you need to build amount of work. You can say, no, look, I have a track record of success. Look at that. Listen to me. But once you get to a point where you, you do have that track record of success and you're comfortable with what you do and you're confident in what you do, you need to be able to say to your client, I'm not going to do that because that is a bad idea. You know, I think that there's this idea in our industry as a whole that if the client tells me to turn a chair by 10 degrees, I should just turn that chair by 10 degrees. Mm. And at best, I've never seen an image fixed by turning a chair. It's never fixed an image yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, wait a second. Wait a second. <laughs> I am making a Facebook post. <laughs> I have never seen an image fixed by turning a chair by... Let's make, let's make it a little bit more extreme. Three degrees. <laughs> you, I mean, you hear that all the time, right? Like, yeah, turn course, it a little and move it a couple inches over. Yeah, of and course, of course. <laughs> as of yet, that hasn't fixed that fixed an image. Um, so at best, your best case scenario is that you go and you waste some time turning that chair, and it doesn't, and it and it looks the same as it did before, more or less. Um, at worst, and here's the problem: when I get comments like that, and I still do get plenty of comments along that line, that is a client that's trying to tell me something and just doesn't know how to tell it to me. Yeah. Right. So like yeah. if they're, yeah. they're telling me to move something a little bit, that's not the problem. It might be that they think the room looks too small or too dark, or there's a million things that they could be trying to, um, uh, communicate to me. And they're just saying in their mind, moving that chair would fix it. And they think it's our goal and our responsibility not to just, take them like, okay, I'll move the chair and that'll fix it. And then you look at it again, they still have complaints. You said, but I moved the chair. Yeah. But you didn't fix whatever that problem was. Like that's something that as someone that wants these images to be great, you want to love your work. It's your job to figure out what they're trying to say. Um, oh, dude, this is so <laughs> fucking awesome. No, seriously, <laughs> seriously. There's a, um, there's a, have you ever heard of Mike Montero? No, I cannot say I have. I'll send you um, a link to him after this. Okay. Um, and hopefully you can like drop it in the, the bottom or something like that. He, he's a graphic designer out in, I think, San Francisco. And he's got some great talks. He has one talk that's called Fuck You, Pay Me, and it's about how to deal with money in ah, your clients. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. I know, I know this, I know this. Um, if you watch some of his other talks, he talks about how... And he's talking about for graphic designers, but it's the same dealing with clients from a creative end. It's the same thing. He says, you know, like part of your, your job isn't just to come up with a great design. It's also to convince your clients that it's like selling your work to your clients is part of your job. And, and he gives an example where he says, you know, if you design this beautiful, you know, logo for a client and then you let the account manager go present it um, to the client and it's blue, you can't be mad when they come back and say, make it green. Even if you had a great reason for it to be blue, it's your job to sell them on the blue and it, to explain why it's blue. And that's the same thing with our images. When they say, um, you know, like another comment that you hear all the time, especially on interiors, is can we make the, the background more blue, the sky more blue, the buildings darker, less hazy? Sometimes you can. But a lot of times, okay, that means that the background is going to feel closer to the camera. You're going to lose a lot of depth in the image. There's a lot of reasons not to do that. And if you can't convince your clients that you shouldn't make that change, you deserve to have to make it. Yeah. Um, that's that's part of our job. And I'd say like the first like year and a half that I was on my own trying to figure out client management and, and when, when should I draw a line how how can I get more of the things out of these images is a really hard thing, but it's a skill that that you need. You absolutely need it. Um, and as a result, 
you get to make more images that you're happy with in the end, and you don't have to do as many, you know, chair turns. Um, but it's a skill, and it's and it's something that you have to like practice. And I think all you can do is practice it. I think that the luckiest, uh, you know, the the luckiest thing that it's happening, or the best thing that it's happening to me, uh, you know, in doing this job of like interviewing artists, is that I'm growing my my baggage of like uh, shared experiences <laughs> yeah. and to be honest with you this talk has given me already so much you know from oh, a real in introspective thing because very often you ask yourself these questions and you kind of do find answers you apply these answers but then when you share this information with others you get a lot of resistance and listening to you saying this stuff is almost like a revelation <laughs> Thank you. I'm flattered. S seriously, dude. Uh, oh, man. We're already 40 minutes in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have a clock over here. I'm, not, <laughs> I'm a timeless human. No, it's just because, you know, stats say that our people usually watch these things for 30 minutes that's, or that's, less. It's, that's the uh, stopping line? It's like, uh, it's like delivering pizza. <laughs> but... Um, Mike, listen, let's for now stop it here. Uh, okay. I, you know, this is, this is awesome. This was awesome. Like, oh, thank um, you very much. I'm glad. It was very fun on my end. It's, uh, it's uh, I don't know. I'm blown away. You know, I'm, I need a little bit of time to process all this. Maybe it's too early in the morning. You know, I, I have to, <laughs> you haven't I, had your full coffee yet. Yeah. It, yeah. It's a good thing that I'm recording this because at one point <laughs> I'll have to take the time and watch the whole thing again. <laughs> Mike, listen, don't leave. I'm going to stop the, 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 uh, the, the recording. I'm just going to say that, you know, if people want to find you, you have two Instagram accounts. Uh, one is MF Golden and the, mm -hmm. other, the other one is Drokis. I yeah. have put it up here. And, and also, I, pay, I pay way more attention to the Droki one because it's all personal work. So even if someone's trying to reach out to me with any questions or anything like that, even if it's about professional work, I'm more likely to respond to Drokis, or at least Droki. Now you got me saying it. I say Droki. <laughs> Droki, right. okay. It's, sorry, a made up, sorry. it's a made-up word, so I don't know how Droki. it's actually supposed to be said. Maybe I, you're right. I'm also going to put your Facebook if it's okay for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. One Dude. of these days, I'll be a real professional, and I'll make a, a, a Facebook page. I'll help company. you out. I'll help you out. <laughs> Thank, Thank <Dude>. you. <laughs> listen, I want to uh, say thank you very much for taking the time to do this. I'm going to say goodbye to our audience and don't go anywhere. I'm going to say goodbye to you too, okay? Thank you so much for having me. I hope people get something out of it. Dude, you're golden. Your last <laughs> name, it's not on purpose. No, it's not on, uh, it's on purpose. <laughs> thank you, my friend. I appreciate that. I'll talk to you in a second. Hold on.